muted, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's good morning, folks. It's Wednesday, January 9th, 2013. Welcome to RenManMusicAndBusiness.com, my favorite website on the web. My name's Steve Rennie. I'm the Ren Man, and this little program is called Ren Man Live. If you don't know what we're up to, we're having a little conversation uh, about today's music business with uh, industry leaders and folks just like yourself, Next, the next wave of industry leaders and artists. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Let me see who we got there in the chat. Oh, we got a nice little turnout today. John Paul Rosales, my buddy Brian Puke Barnell, Throw the Goat. We're going to be talking to Throw the Goat soon, getting a little update on them, seeing what's going on. Deborah Zook Smith, haven't met you before, Deborah Zook, but you remind me of my dog Duke. Duke and Zook, we miss you. We miss both of you madly here. Duke is on, uh, Duke went to college today. Uh, he'll be back for us uh, on Friday, I think. Um, coming up on today's show, before I waste any more time, we've been talking about songs and songwriting uh, this week. As you know, uh, the music business is all about great songs. It starts with a great song. So on Monday, we talked with an old friend and a great songwriter himself, Tom Kelly, who's written a number of big uh, number one singles, including Like a Virgin. Uh, he spoke with us about the creative side, about the whole process of making songs. Today, we're going to spend a little time on one of my favorite subjects, getting the money. You've seen the video, get the fucking money. That's what we're talking about today. So we're going to talk about the business of songs a bit. We're going to have our friend uh, Mario Gonzalez, music attorney extraordinaire, and a return engagement to uh, Ren Man Live today. He's going to join us in the office to talk about what to look for for in a music publishing deal. Um, our friend Sean O'Malley from ASCAP he works at one of, uh, is a big performing rights society. He's going to join us on Skype to talk about how performing rights uh, societies work and what they can do for you and how you can join. And then finally, our friend Jake Versluis from Precision Music and a former rent management alumni who I'm very proud of. Uh, is going to be joining us today to talk about licensing music for film, TV, commercials, and other applications and so forth. So, before we dive into all of this, you know, we got a saying around here at Ren Management. We started this website to help connect young musicians and music industry professionals with leaders in the business. We wanted to bring you virtually into my office. Uh, but it requires a little two-way interaction here, folks. So if you, if you didn't see it before, if you haven't seen it, we're going to show it to you one more time. Here's our model. If you don't ask, you don't get. All right? So today, I want you to step out from behind the class, the guys at the back of the class, I want you to get out and front of the curtain. I want you to man the freaking heck up and ask some questions. You've got some big people today. They're, they're willing to help you. Today, we have our lovely intern, Audrey Ben-Walid. There she is. Hi. Say hello, Audrey. Don't be shy. Okay. Audrey is going to be encouraging you folks to ask some questions on the chat board for you folks that are too shy to call in and so forth. So she'll be rounding up some questions and popping them into the broadcast. Now, if you're feeling especially dangerous, folks, uh, we started the Ren Man Hotline, which has been anything but hot so far. So today we'd like you to rattle that phone number. We'll throw you into the conversation and you can talk to Mario or uh, Jake in person. So there you have it. For the new folks that might be joining us for the first time or who have stumbled upon our little world here, let me tell you what we're up to. We started this site uh, to help young musicians and music professionals. Every Monday and Wednesday and Friday now, we have a webcast, Ren Man Live, where we bring in folks to talk with you about the business. Um, if you're not familiar with our little network of sites, let me give a, a quick run now. If you type in www.renmanmb.com, you'll see the front page of our site there where there's all kinds of highlights from all the stuff that we're doing here. Some great information for all of you. If you are a YouTube fan and don't have a lot of time to watch a broadcast, you can type in Ren Man MB on the YouTube YouTube channel. You'll see all kinds of real highlights, great nuggets of information, you know, our bits from our interviews with all our guests. And I'm sure you'll, learn, you'll, you'll find something great there. If you want to go back and check out our live broadcast, you go to livestream.com slash RenmanMB. We have a whole list of archives of great stuff that we've done previously and some stuff that's coming up. And then if you want to keep track of what's going on uh, on the site and what's going on on the show, keep up with us on twitter.com. Our handle is at RenmanMB. MB. And finally, uh, where would we be with that? Where would we be, you silly wabbit? Uh, without Facebook.com. So check us out right there. Um, 
Each day we start off with the news of uh, the music business, and today is going to be no different. Um, but before we get to real news, let me just make a comment here. Uh, we're going to be taking the Ren Man Live Act on the road against my better judgment, and we're going to start not somewhere local that where it would be easy. No, we're going to go all the way to Cannes, France, to do our first Red Man Live on the road. I'll be speaking at the Medium Conference there at the end of January, uh, and I'll be talking about building artist careers in the music business, and I've also been invited against, you know, all odds to be on their Music Visionary panel on Monday. And as soon as that Music Visionary panel is over, we're going to be broadcasting live uh, from the stage there in Cannes, France. So, so it should be a lot of fun, and I hope you'll join us. And Joe will put up the, the website there as we go. All right, Music Business News. This, the, the vacation is over. Top album in the country. Taylor Swift again, man, she is just knocking it out. She just can't get rid of her off the charts. Uh, it's easier for her to get rid of boyfriends than to get her off the chart, I'll tell you that. But she's number one again. God, she's never going to be on the show if I keep this up. I really do like Taylor Swift, though, but I'm glad I'm not her boyfriend. Anyway, number one record for... Uh for her, it's a bunch of weeks. My friend, Mr. Bruno Mars, I've become a huge fan, is number four. Imagine Dragons, one of those great bands we talked about, the K-Rock show, number six, and another one of my favorites, the Lumineers. We're hoping to talk to the gentleman who runs their label about how the Lumineers broke. So that's the top albums in the country. This week on the singles chart, I knew you were trouble, Taylor Swift, uh, locked out of heaven, Bruno Mars. I was singing that Bruno Mars song all weekend long, playing great you know, playing golf, and I just love that guy. That's some of the, 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 the top music out there in the world. And uh, there's also some news items. We go to billboardmagazine.com is where I get all my great information here. I still love reading it, although I typically read it just online now. And uh, I'll say this. I spend a lot of time on the news, and every once in a while, you'll just see a story out there that, that makes you want to scratch your head, you, where you just read it and you, you can't believe it. It just makes you want to scream out, are you fucking kidding me? Right, and here's our Are You Freaking Kidding Me segment today. Justin Bieber smoking the weed. That's what they say. Somebody's got a video. They think he's smoking the weed. And uh, shocking, frankly. Uh, the Biebs, he's got a real reputation to protect there. And I guess he kind of copped to it. He goes, he did a Twitter post. Every day I'm growing and learning, trying to be better. You get knocked down, you get up. I guess when he gets knocked down, he kind of gets up with that weed. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to get off Justin Bieber's thing because he's not the first celebrity to get caught smoking weed. And frankly, I think there's bigger things going on in the world. Lots of states out there are, are, are rethinking that whole process, uh, including California. Um, but while we're on the subject of weed and musicians, I see that Frank Ocean was cited for marijuana possession last week. Uh, he's, you know, hangs out a lot with those guys in Odd Future. I'm not sure that they're trying to keep their weed use a secret, but last year, I guess, Rihanna, Willie Nelson, Snoop Dogg, and Wiz Khalifa were all out there smoking the herb. So anyway, shocking news, Justin. I forgive you, though, because I love your music, and that's all that really matters. So uh, there's our bit with the news today. Today, now let's get on to some more serious matters. One of my great friends in the business is a music attorney by the name of Mario Gonzalez. Mario was gracious enough to join us uh, earlier in the year to talk about some legal issues and has offered to, to come back from time to time. So I decided to take him up on his offer. Today, I want to join my good buddy, Mario Gonzalez, here again today. How you doing, Mario? Great. What's going on? How was the holidays? Terrific. Yeah, well, Happy New Year and all that stuff. Um, as Mario and I have discussed where Mario put out a great thing that's on the site. Maybe we can tag it again today called the glossary of all the terms in the music business and stuff and a lot of legal terms. And there's a ton of stuff out there. This week, Mario, we've been talking about uh, songs and songwriting and publishing and all of that kind of stuff. So today I thought I would ask you to come in and talk about the music publishing deal uh, and, and why that's important and what are the key elements to look for in, in a publishing deal. So with that little lead in, I'll, I'll turn you back. I'm going to use the blackboard. Okay. Now, Mario, I know, has spoken many times at university, so he's familiar with this blackboard. I'll be doing a speaking or a teaching assignment at Berkeley Online School of Music, so I'll be taking notes here. Right. Mario Gonzalez on music publishing, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, First thing is, what is publishing? 
And it's not a stupid question. There's a very famous interview with Tom Petty when he first, he's, uh, Tom Petty and he had a band called The Mud Crutch. They came to Los Angeles looking for their record deal. And part of his record deal with Shelter Records, he was, he was offered a publishing deal. And he, I read this interview with Tom, and I've done a lot of work with Tom, but read this interview with Tom, it's probably in the Rolling Stones, where he said, publishing, that means like sheet music? Oh, what's the big deal? I might as well just, sure, I'll make a deal to put songbooks out with my music on it. He had no idea what music publishing means. And unless you really study it or get into it, you wouldn't know what music publishing means. Music publishing, as far as songbooks and print, print, uh, you know, uh, sheet music is such an infinitesimal part of the business. In fact, it, because of the internet and people basically making all this stuff available on the internet, it is almost, uh, as of today, non-existent. Uh, there are a few music bookstores you can buy music, but it, it, it really means almost nothing, almost nothing to you as a songwriter, artist to, uh, to, to sell sheet music. So then, that being said, what is music publishing? Well, music publishing is really copyright administration of musical compositions of works. And there are a variety of exclusive rights by owning a copyright that you have. And if people want to use those rights, they have to pay you for it. So for most bands, for most artists, the biggest source of income, I put source of income, is mechanicals. And let me explain what mechanicals is because it's not obvious. Okay, mechanicals is a royalty that a record company pays to reproduce your song on each copy of a record. The reason it's called mechanicals is because it was uh, named back in the days of piano rolls. And if you had a piano, maybe some of you haven't known this, but if you have a piano roll that you put in a piano back in the 19, probably 10s, uh, it would play music. And they called this a, a mechanical reproduction. That has lasted all through the generations from vinyl in the 80s to compact disc to, uh, to uh, uh, I mean, uh, tape cassettes to compact disc, now to digital and uh, downloading off of iTunes and other websites. They always use the word mechanical. Think of it as the royalty that the record company pays to reproduce a song on each copy of the record that's made. In the United States, it's a statutory rate. I believe it's 9.2 cents or 9.1 cent right now. There's a longer formula if the song's over four and a half minutes approximately. But think in terms of the record company paying 9.1 cents for every album, every download that is sold. Now, if you have 10 songs on your album, that's generating mechanicals in the United States of close to a $1 a record. Uh, most albums now have many more than that, 12, 13 tracks. So it's over a dollar if they're paying at the full statutory rate. This is a huge number, and it's, by the way, paid from the first record sold. Um, record royalties, you have to recoup video cost and recording cost and tour support and everything else the record company can think of. Not the case with the mechanicals. You sell one record, you get your mechanicals on that one record. Wow, well, can I interrupt real quick? Just as that's so when people were, were thinking about it, you got to have your publishing. That's what was the big number because you're making an extra buck from day one. No, no charges back against it. That was your real money. And that's why everybody said, "Oh, you got to have your publishing, right?" It's also the reason why if you look at bands that don't share their publishing equally. Mm -hmm. Not to name a few, not to name anybody, not to name yeah. like Fleetwood Mac or anybody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You will sign, see that the people that write the songs live in huge houses. Yeah, and the people that don't write the song, maybe not. We talked to one of them on Monday. It Tom, is a huge. <laughs> yeah. you, you can you can you can see the the, the people in the uh, you know uh, the band that make the money yeah. are the people that are collecting this. Great. Okay. By so the way, mechanicals about. are only from record sales. So if you have a turntable hit, in other words, you're not selling any records, but you're getting a lot of uh, a lot of uh, airplay. airplay. 
they're really not making a lot of mechanicals. We'll talk about the net the okay. next segment with ASCAP. All right. All right. So the next segment is performance income. If I can spell it from this angle. Um, and this is basically in the U.S. ASCAP, BMI, and a CSAC. Okay. So mechanicals is a license to reproduce your song on a record or including a digital download. A performance is a license to perform your song. Who pays performance royalties? Radio stations pay performance. Uh, any sort of live music venue from the corner bar to the country club to the Staples Center, they all pay ASCAP and BMI license, which allows them to perform that music uh, at their venues. So even if uh, Joe Blow comes in and sings a Rolling Stones song at the local bar, the Rolling Stones are getting a performance income. Uh, I, I won't go into the history of ASCAP and BMI. We're gonna be talking with them. Uh, or when or get, into the, uh, get into the argument of who's better. But they collect this money. This performance from, from the broadcasters, from the live entertainment venues and so forth. Now, just big difference here. The mechanicals are paid by the record company to the music publisher. ASCAP and BMI are run by a lot of songwriters, and for whatever reason, like they don't trust the publishers to pay them, ASCAP and BMI and CSAC agree that we're gonna pay approximately half the money to the publisher and half the money to the songwriter. So the songwriter, even if he gives 100% of his publishing to a third party publisher, will hang on to his songwriter royalties and he will get a check from ASCAP for those songwriter royalties. Mechanicals, all played to the publisher, and the publisher has the obligation to pay the songwriters over, whereas this money gets split at source, um, as you can well imagine. Uh, and, and, and the songwriter royalties are almost ever, ever, ever used to recoup whatever advance was given to the songwriter. So 100%, so let's say the, the, the publisher says, I'll give you a $10,000 advance for your song. He's gonna take it out 100% of the mechanicals. He will only take it out of the publisher's share of ASCAP and BMI, BMI money. The songwriter's share of BMI money will go to the songwriter, even though the songwriter has an unrecouped balance. And then there's just a, 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 a third group that I'll throw everything into it. The biggest is synchronization licenses, and that is the use of your song in an audiovisual work. A movie, a video game, a television program, very, very lucrative. Uh, I, just did a, uh, I just did a synchronization license yesterday mm -hmm. for, I mean, $350,000 for Love a commercial. That. Mario, can I talk uh, to you when we're done, see if you get yeah, me one yeah, of those? Yeah, right, 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 right. Uh, Good work. That's can, how Mario affords you, to come can, on our show, sing, folks, can you because sing he in actually Spanish. gets some billed hours here. So we have what we call uh, uh, synchronization licenses. We have the little bit of print money that comes in. Just sort of think of this as sort of the catch-all. When I say print money, I mean like songbooks, sheet music, which I told you are almost non-existent at this time. But this could also include things like, uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, uh, greeting cards. Uh, that play music when you open him, or a talking trout on the side of your wall, any sort of, wherever that music is, it comes into this area. It's not a mechanical, it's not a performance, it's in this area. Um, uh, uh, an alarm clock that at the, at, 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 instead of hearing an alarm, you hear bridge over troubled water. Those are those types of licenses. So all this money comes in, okay? What we often talk is the co-publisher share and the songwriter share. Well, let me let me just describe what the publisher is. The publisher is a person or entity that acquires the right to decide how the music is going to be exploited, what's it going to cost for the exploitation of the record. So, if I'm uh, you know if I'm Spielberg, I'm doing the new movie and I want to use this song, you don't call the songwriter, you call the publisher. Now, the songwriter could be the publisher but you call the publisher. The publisher has administration rights, and those rights give him the right, perhaps certain to subject, certain things may be subject to the songwriter's approval, but 
it's the publisher who makes the licenses for all, all of these different all of these different things. Um, the publishing income is basically split. Fifty cents of every dollar is the publisher's share, and fifty cents is the songwriter's share. It isn't always exact, but think of that to to to, to understand this. So that means if there's one dollar that comes in in mechanicals, for example, fifty cents goes to the publisher and fifty cents goes to the songwriter. Well, it didn't take very long before the songwriter to say, look, I wrote the song, why the hell are you getting half the money? You know, my manager only takes 15%, why are you taking 50%? So publishers came up with a concept called the co-publishing deal, or songwriters thing. And what happens is that if you are a co-publisher, then the, co the publisher's agreeing to split this 50 cents in some fashion with the songwriter. A typical co-publishing deal is 50-50. Uh, so this 50 cents that goes to the publisher, actually 25 cents goes to the songwriter. So for every dollar, songwriter, uh, publisher collects a dollar, he gives the songwriter 50 cents as a songwriter royalty, he gives the songwriter 25 cents as his co-publisher share, and he retains the remaining 25 cents as his publisher share. Can I ask that's, a question, Mario? That's a co-publishing deal. Let me yes. ask a question now. For the average person out there that's watching the show today, are they going to be in a position of leverage where they can get a co-publishing deal yes. out of the box? Yes. Okay. Uh, co-publishing deals are more common, way more common than 100% publishing deals. If this was 1960, uh, and a certain uh, publishing company. we won't mention here. Right, we don't mention here. They take 100% of the publishing, so it's a 50-50 split of the income. But, you know, every publisher nowadays will make a 50-50 publishing deal. It's, it's still a high price to pay. 25 cents out of every dollar is now going to your co-publisher. At, at least it's not 50 cents. Uh, very quickly, uh, the splits. The, the, I've been talking about the splits of, let's say, 50-50 songwriter-publisher or 75-25 songwriter. One of the things to look out for in the splits is, is the publisher trying to take an administration fee off the top? And as the lawyer for the songwriter, you want that administration fee taken off the top. You want it removed. Because why should he take enough, why should the publisher take 5% off the top and then you're only splitting the remaining 95 cents? My argument would be, representing the songwriter, look, for his 25 cents, he's earning they enough money. Yeah. Um, the other thing, real quickly, this is a little technical, at source, and what happens is publishers maybe sign a deal with you in the United States and then they have all these sub-publishers outside of the United States. The, for example, they have a sub-publisher in France. The sub-publisher in France collects a dollar, well, the equivalent there in francs, and that sub-publisher takes off a piece of it and pays the remaining balance over to publisher. The question becomes, does the songwriter get 75% of what was collected in France, or does the, sub does the songwriter get 75% of what's collected by the US company? Well, if you have companies like uh, Warner Chapel, Universal, which are, have all these foreign affiliates, you want the money to be computed at source. You don't want them taking off 25% in France so that in effect you're only getting, let's say, 75% of 75%. That's called uh, at source. Uh, we're almost done. Yeah, well, then we uh, got some questions coming in. That obviously right. got some key, questions. Key, for you. key point the term of the agreement. When I started practicing law, most publishers wanted life of copyright. They wanted that song in perpetuity. Uh, thanks to the English, really, and, and it was really Richard Griffiths of Virgin Music. Uh, pu boss. The publishers, uh, saw, they, they came over and, they were, and it, they, were, they were just further along in England. And those songwriters say, we're not going to give you our songs for the rest of our lives. We'll give it to you for the term of the agreement, how long we're signed to you, mm -hmm. and then maybe another five years. And the publishers say, yeah, but if you're unrecouped, your advances are unrecouped, then maybe another five years after that. They would, but at some point in time, 
you know, the Beatles songs, the Rolling Stones songs, and so forth would, would come back to the songwriter. Unfortunately, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones did not have that in their agreements, and that's why their early songs are owned by other people. Think that cost them a few pennies there, Mario? Yeah, I think yeah. that was a little... Yeah, the Beatles. What, yeah. So, what you want to negotiate is a reversion. <laughs> At some point in time, your songs need to come back to you. And the one thing I'll say about that, Songs that are recorded during the term of your agreement, they should have longer than the songs that you wrote, but they never got recorded. So it would be normal to say, if you get my song covered during the term of the agreement, you can keep it for the term of the agreement plus five years after it. However, with regard to all those songs I gave you that you never did squat with, I should get them back let's say within 18 months or one year after the term of the agreement, because you know what? They're just gonna sit on your shelves. They're not making any money. You had enough time to, to shop them. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. why should you hold on to those songs if seven years from now, somebody comes out of the woodwork and wants to cover it? You had nothing to do with that. So big, big point, reversion. Yeah. Lastly, when to make a publishing deal. What you get when you make a publishing deal is an advance. What price do you pay for that advance? Well, in a co-publishing deal that's normal, you're paying a 25% income. So in effect, by you saying, I will take $100,000 now, you're also saying, I will only get 75% of the income. Well, if an artist truly believes he's gonna be successful, he would say, I'm not gonna take that deal. 25% is like paying 25% interest to the bank. I will not take that deal. Um, uh, they will but other artists kind of use it as an insurance policy. Yeah, but what happens if my record comes out, I got a lot of heat on it, I got a great producer, I got the record company agreeing to spend all this money on a video, I got all these things happening, and what happened if the record comes out and completely stiffs? I won't get any advance. And if music publishers are standing there and saying, we're willing to give you 250,000 or more or something like that, in effect, you're buying an insurance company because if you do take that 250,000 the records are stiff you don't have to pay the money back so the you know like i said the question is and this is an individual case has your record generated enough steam so that you will get the highest uh, advance you can get or are you basically selling it prematurely for a very low advance and costing yourself now nobody has crystal balls to know exactly how much the record is eventually gonna yeah. sell. It's just a gut level thing. Uh, I think these are the things that artists that are thinking about making a, a, a publishing, these are the kind of things you need to talk about with your manager and your lawyer because they're important decisions. Early on in your career, you may need that money to fund certain things so it makes some sense. You know, our, our guest Tom Kelly, early in his career, was, was not, didn't have to make a publishing deal and, and made him millions of dollars. I know bands that if they didn't make a publishing deal, mm -hmm. the band would have broke up because yeah. nobody could pay the rent of the apartment. Okay, now one we got, last, okay, last, right. we got, we got a couple questions very from before point. we go. Publishers, however, will tell you the reason they make a publishing deal is that we're going to take your songs, we're going to exploit them in whole new ways you haven't even thought about, we're going to make you co-writers, we're going to get them in movies, we're going to get them in video games, we're going to get them in commercials. That is what they will say. Other people look at it and say, no, the reason I'm making a publishing deal is to get that advance. If any of that other stuff happens, they creatively help the song. Yeah. We're going to talk with uh, uh, Sony ATV president Jody Gerson on Friday about what a publisher can actually have. Before you go, Audrey Ben Walid here, who is our intern and also an attorney herself, uh, has got some questions. She's been monitoring the chat board, so I know Mario's got to take off. But let's get a couple well, I, questions. You huh? have to ask Jody about the huge rage race she's just. Had. Uh, you can. I'll put that question <laughs> on the page. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. A couple huge, questions from Audrey Ben Walid. Fire away, Audrey. Okay. So um, the Morning King submitted a question here and. And they ask, how should a band split up the ownership of the songs written? For example, if someone writes the lyrics and another member writes the main guitar part and then they record the full band, who owns the song? Really, really interesting question. And I'll give you two examples, okay? Um, um, I used to be involved with a band called Great White. I was also involved with, uh, with the manager of Guns N' Roses. His attitude was, 
everybody should split the publishing equally. That way you're not fighting over every song because if you start splitting every song, oh, well, this one you get 12%, the other one you get, then all of a sudden the creative process breaks down. You want everybody to be involved, okay? Everybody, uh, and so some managers take the position, look, everything's gonna split equally. And if you think about it, that's what Lennon and McCartney did and that's what Mick Jagger and Keith Richards did. And you know that a lot of songs were not written by either sure, one of them, sure. well, only by one of them, but everything's Lennon McCartney, everything's uh, mm -hmm. Jagger Richards on everything they do. So that's the one approach. That's the approach that says for the, for the tranquility and working together, the band Keeping will go that peace, way. the peace, I like to say. Yeah. <laughs> so I, have, I had a band when I first started, uh, started working uh, named um, the Climax Blues Band, who probably I remember don't them. remember. I well, do you do remember. remember. I do remember. We're dating ourselves, Mario. Their first, <laughs> their first two albums, they split all the publishing equally. Okay. Their third album, they said, you know what? We're sick of it. The guys who were writing say, we're sick of this. These people aren't writing the songs. We're changing. Now we're going to, have, everybody's going to basically eat what they sell or what they yeah, kill. Yeah. And they decided to go a whole separate different, different, way. different way. And keyboard player writes the song, I Love You, never had written the song before, number one hit all over the world. So. <laughs> and then they threw him out and, and broke up the band, right? Every, it was, so the guys who were like pissed off yeah. about splitting everything equally. Host themselves. They, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. One more question, Audrey, then Mario's got to get out of here. Okay, um, so this question is from Jason Matuskiewicz. And Jason, he says, we just call him Jason M. I can't Jason. pronounce it easy, but he's <laughs> over it. And he'll be particularly over it with you. Okay, so he asks, when a licensing agent or publisher is granted a right to retitle a composition, is it safe to assume that it's merely for publishing purposes to facilitate the non-exclusivity of the agreement? Or can they mess with my creative vision by renaming my future hits? Can you tell Jason is a lawyer by that question? Okay, Jason, come on, man. Talk to us real folks. Go ahead. Sorry, Mario. <laughs> um, usually in a publishing deal, by the way, I call it a publishing deal. It's really publishing slash songwriter deal. And one can make a deal just for songwriter, where he gives up 100% of the publishing, but in a publishing deal slash songwriter deal, it would be very common that for the songwriters say, you cannot name, rename the title of my songs without my consent. And that way it gets, gets done there. Uh, sometimes we do it purposefully for the following reason. Uh, and I'll just try to be brief here. ASCAP and BMI, do not give you the sources of all the uh, money, uh, all sorts of money. So let's say I have a song, Coffee Cup, okay? Coffee Cup, ASCAP and BMI are gonna account for Coffee Cup. Mm -hmm. All right, let's say, Steve, you happen to know somebody in the film company that just said, you know, I can get Coffee Cup in that film and mm -hmm. on that soundtrack album. Mm -hmm. So we go, but Steve says, I want 15% for doing that, for putting it in there. Well, what happens is that, what happens when we get the ASCAP statement? Mm -hmm. It's just gonna say coffee cup, and it's not gonna say how much came from the film and how much came from all the other sources. Mm -hmm. So we might title the song, Coffee Cup Rennie, just yeah. to give it a different name so that ASCAP, when he gets the statement, he goes, oh, the Coffee Cup Rennie, that's, he gets 15% of that. He doesn't get 15% of all Got this it. other stuff. That's the reason why people revise names. And obviously in foreign translations, you're, you're gonna wanna, re, you're gonna wanna re, uh, change the name. I'm changing all my songs. Now, okay. Okay, what I just gave you was what, 10, 15 minutes? This could have easily been an hour. There is a resource I would highly recommend Go to Wixen Music Publishing. If you Google Wixen Music Publishing, he, uh, Randall also has a UK company, and look under the um, look under the menu item that says, um, what does it say? Music Publishing Primary. Music Publishing Primary, and the first item after that it says, what is music publishing? This is only a three or four page, very succinct thing, which will explain in much better, clearer detail than I did this morning. Uh, this primer, and there's, by the way, if you go back up to the menu, there are other subjects, like the last one is very helpful. It's for, it's for uh, terminating and uh, transfers under uh, uh, copyright. But all of these things are very helpful to look at. 
if you want more information than that, Todd and uh, Ted, I mean, Todd I'm and Jeff Brabeck wrote a book. It's uh, how many editions I don't know. Uh, Jeff is business affairs at Chrysalis Publishing. Todd was for many many years the head of ASCAP in, in the U.S. You can buy that book any place, and of course you can always go to Don Passman's uh, sort of Bible. Don mm. has a fairly big section on publishing, but I think. You start with the primer on Randall Wixon's website. I think you'll understand what these terms, uh, what, what I've been talking about today. And again, uh, the glossary that is on Renman, uh, if you don't understand, if you can't remember what the term mechanical, for example, link means, to that. There it is right you, there. You can, <clears throat> you can go to my website. I have a glossary, and you can see it, well, what the words are. Fine job here today. I feel like I learned something here today. Uh, Mario's got to go back and get me one of those big licensing deals right now. Mario, thanks for joining us here today. And I uh, look forward to having you back again soon. We're going to cut you loose You're so you welcome. can go make some money. Thanks a lot, Mario. All right, late, applause, please, Darren. Do we have some applause? Okay, you know, we practice this stuff, folks, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about ASCAP and, and BMI and, and performance rights societies, and uh, it's a big part of the income side of, of the business. When you write a song, you know, the publishing we just discussed, but when a song gets performed out there in the real world, whether it's a concert, radio, TV, or otherwise, ultimately ASCAP and the performance rights uh, societies get involved, and, and and so we're going to talk with a gentleman today who we're going to talk to on Skype, a gentleman by the name of Sean O'Malley from ASCAP, who's going to talk to us and explain all of that public performance rights stuff. Sean, are you on there with us? I am. How are you guys? Right. There he is. Uh, first off, Sean, uh, great to see you. Happy New Year and all of that. Um, but first, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to help uh, some of our members learn a little bit more about the music business. Absolutely. So first off, let me ask the, the obvious question there. Uh, there's a number of performing rights societies around the world, and I think most folks are vaguely aware of, of what the names and the, and the entities are, but they're not quite as certain about what it is they do. So describe for us what it is that a performing arts society does for its members. Sure. I mean, at the simplest and most basic uh, form of a PRO is to collect and distribute public performance royalties. And to be more specific on that, uh, we are going to represent uh, independent songwriters, uh, composers, uh, and as well as publishers, and their interests in the public performance royalty that's guaranteed by the U.S. copyright. So essentially, instead of each individual uh, member of, at ASCAP, having to go out and negotiating a license with every bar and grill, with every radio station, with every television station. We're actually going to do that all. And the main thing I think uh, that has kind of been lost in translation over the years is the importance of collective bargaining. That's really what the PROs bring to the table. Now, you mentioned briefly there, you know, I just want to recap them so people are clear on it. Who, who are the people that you collect from at the end of the day? Sure, yeah. I, well, Literally, the easiest answer is everyone. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to think of it. But essentially, if, if they're having a performance of music for the public, we are there to license and collect those royalties on behalf of our members, our writer and publisher members. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, every bar and grill that you can think of, every cafe, every, like I said, radio station, television station, internet websites, any place where their use of music has been... Uh, defined as a public performance, ASCAP can represent our members and go and collect that money and distribute it. Would that include live performances? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's probably uh, the most important thing to ASCAP in some ways because that was the genesis of ASCAP in 1914, almost 100 years ago, was really about live performance. Obviously, these days uh, we see performances in all these other media, but at the time there wasn't radio and television, so of course... Uh, live performance was the primary source of income. Okay, so now I, I've been in the business now for, for 35 years, Sean, and uh, I wouldn't claim to be the smartest guy in the world, but I'm, I'm not the dumbest either. Um, how, does, how are these payments calculated? It, it, I think it's something of a mystery about, you know, how some, once they've made the performances, how you go about calculating 
um, where these performances happen and how to pay your artists. Yeah, of course. I, I don't think you're alone in that uh, uh, difficulty in understanding or comprehending how we do it. Um, on, on, a, on a very kind of uh, surface basis, without going into details, because each media is going to have slightly different rules, the best way to understand the concept is follow the dollar. And what I mean by that is we're going to pay you the monies that we, you know, pay our members based upon the performances that occur in that specific licensee. So, for example, when someone has a performance on NBC, that network, that's a network performance. We're going to take the money out of that exact license fee that NBC pays us, and we're trying to take that NBC pie, if you will, and slice it up into pieces that uh, reflect the licensing value of these, the performances of the music in, on NBC. When you talk about you know, a radio station like K-Rock in Los Angeles, uh, same thing applies. Obviously, they pay a different license fee, so the uh, amount of money is based upon that. But then you also talk about other factors that we use, such as you know, duration and time of day. Uh, time of day only applies in television. We use these other factors to help us better calculate the uh, value of these performances to those licensees. But at the end of the day, we're really looking at it from the point of view of how can we reflect the true value of this performance if ASCAP wasn't the one licensing it? You know, what, what is that value if the uh, network decided that they were going to do it themselves? They were going to distribute those royalties to all the, the songwriters and composers and publishers. Obviously, that's a Herculean task for every one of those licensees, and it's, it's probably shouldn't even say probably, it's, it's wasteful of money to have each of those doing that administration individually. That's really the, one of the core concepts of ASCAP doing it. And again, like I said, I think the collective bargaining from the members, from the writer and publisher member side, that's really an important factor because uh, when, when I talk about this in lectures or anything else, I always tell people, you know, if you have a performance that's equal to a performance by Beyonce, you get paid the same amount of money as Beyonce. Now, I don't know of any other part in the music business where you're going to get that without having the same representation, clout, et cetera, as Beyonce. So this is a really important concept um, where, you know, really you have a symbiotic relationship between all writers and publishers. It's, like I said, it's really a core part of our business. Now, I think that's easier to get a grasp on if you're talking about a TV appearance. You know, young band appears on NBC, um, Tonight Show or David right. Letterman, they're still going to see the same number of people as Beyonce. But That's there are right. other areas where not all artists are created equal, and one in particular is at radio. Um, how, how do you how do you you know how do you get the proper you know number to each of the people? Because clearly Beyonce is getting more plays than artists you know a brand new artist, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a good point. It really, at the end of the day, it comes down to eyeballs. You know, that's probably the easiest way to think about it. Or really, when you talk about music, you know, your ears. <laughs> um, how many people are actually paying attention? When you talk about a performance on television, to your point, you know, it airs on NBC. There's going to be millions of people watching that and hearing that music. And that's part of what they sell to their advertisers. When you talk about radio stations, this is also similar. A larger radio station has a uh, expected you know, output to the audience of a certain volume. And that might be different on a large radio station versus a small, smaller radio station. And again, that's going to ref be reflected in how much we charge them the license fee, and therefore will also be reflected in how we distribute those royalties from that license fee. Um, really, again, the main thing to understand here is it is about volume. When you talk about uh, having one performance on K-Rock, going back to my example of the Los Angeles radio station earlier, you're going to have a value that's greater than one performance on a radio station that's a tenth of the size. And I know that sounds obvious, but I think honestly, that's something that commonly gets lost in translation. People want everything to be paid equally. And as you said, um, while the performance may be equal, the artist or um, the music may not be based upon how the audience reacts. If the audience wants to hear you know, this song 10 times a day, it's gonna make more money than the song they only wanna hear once in a year. Got it. All right, and that's, I think, the part that's always kind of mysterious, how, how you guys calculate. But, you know, ASCAP's been around for years, folks, and they're a well-trusted organization out there. Let me ask you something else, because we're talking about these different sources of income. What impact has the Internet had now? Because, you know, like in 1914, they were calculating performances at dance halls. There was no radio, there was no TV, and there was certainly no Internet. You know, I spent a good part of my career in the business with no Internet and, and a good part now with the Internet. How has that changed your business? 
business in, in what are you guys doing to help collect on the web? Yeah, that, it's a very important time for uh, any type of, you know, what has been coined new media, but I would just call, you know, any type of uh, technological advancements where, you know, you really have this burgeoning environment. And it's not unlike what we had to go through in the 30s with radio and what we had to go through in the, I think it was 50s for television. My point is, anytime you have a new invention and it changes how people uh, consume music, you have to recalibrate how you actually license that, how you uh, calculate royalties, et cetera. And that's kind of where we're at. We're in that beginning steps with, uh, with the internet. Specifically, some of the things that people ask about when, uh, with regards to you know, Spotify or Pandora, you're really looking at uh, a world where advertisers haven't yet properly focused their attention to this new world. I think it's a matter of time. I don't think it's you know, uh, an impossible feat for them to get there, but it is a matter of time. When that happens, that's going to allow ASCAP and other PROs to charge more money to these licensees uh, because they're getting more of that advertising revenue. Their revenue is increasing, and the number of people paying attention or, or listening to the music will increase. And at that point, I think you'll see something more akin to you know, radio and television. But again, right now, everything's so small, and the volume of performances is so high that these values are, are almost dishearteningly low. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I'm kind of in a neutral position in some ways to this. Obviously, we advocate strongly on behalf of our members, and we believe that uh, you know they should be higher fees paid. Um, at the same time, we, we want to create partnerships with our licensees. We're really we really look at ASCAP as servicing our our members first, but we also try to service our licensees because at the end of the day, they're the customer uh, for our members. So it really is uh, a balancing act, and I think you'll see more. Uh, positive results as, again, the advertising dollars flow through. Got it. Let me ask you a, a, another question here. Um, you know, ASCAP it, it is, is clearly one of the biggest performing rights societies out there. But I think people are not clear on what, if any, are the differences between the, the performing rights societies. Can you speak to that, Sean? Absolutely. I, I think the most important thing at ASCAP is that we're a membership organization. And what that means is that our board of directors is comprised of writers and publishers. At the end of the day, that means that the interests of ASCAP are always pushed by writers and publishers. And I think that's a really important core concept for our organization because it, it means that we're not ever interested in anything but the most money to the most, you know, being distributed to the most writers and publishers. And I think that aggressiveness, because we're, we're serving uh, those, those goals, leads us to a very uh, fair um, negotiation with the licensees and we're able to also, with a very, very low administration cost, um, we're able to distribute that money at, at, at a very affordable rate that actually makes the licensees very happy. So I think that's probably the main thing is the membership organization. There's lots of differences uh, as well. I mean, we do a lot of uh, you know, support type events like our ASCAP I Create Music Expo, which is a, has been a huge success every year it's been running. It's, it'll be again in April in, in Los Angeles and uh, other events like that. And, and again, I think the other thing is service. You know, we really pride ourselves at ASCAP. Everyone that works at ASCAP, I will tell you, has an a undying love of music and an undying love of music creators. And I think uh, you see that translate in, in how we interact. So, you know, I, I oversee our member services department and, and certainly I, I invite any of our ASCAP members to contact us via our 800 number through our member access, which is our online system. Um, you know, the, we're really using technology to try to connect as much as possible with the members. And I think that's really what it comes down to. All right. Well, one final question for you, Sean. Um, if you're a, if we got a brand new songwriter or somebody that's just starting off or just started their own publishing company, how do they join ASCAP? It's as simple as filling out an online application on our website. Uh, you can join as both a uh, writer and publisher if you're self-published. We're actually in the process of uh, streamlining our online application uh, again. We're going to launch it in, in the middle of the year. And honestly, my goal there is to make it as easy as 60 seconds for someone to complete out an application. So really, if you're, if you're a music creator and you're putting your music you know, even if it's on a, a YouTube page that's only getting 10 hits, I, I really encourage you to join ASCAP and be part of uh, a membership organization that really is looking after the interests of music creators everywhere. 
Well, you know, that's what this site's all about. So I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, I know that um, our members and viewers today will know a lot more about the business. And even I do. I think I might pass the test on performing right societies. Sean, I want to thank you for joining us. And, and maybe we'll be talking again here when we have uh, performance rights issues coming up. You did great Absolutely. for us today. No, absolutely. You're most welcome. And anytime you guys have any questions, bring me back. I'll be happy to answer them. You got it. Thank you very much. Take care now. Thanks, Steve. Take care. All right. That was Sean O'Malley from ASCAP. This is good stuff. I see we got quite a few folks still in the chat board, you know. Honest to God, folks, I thought, you know, this is kind of, I thought, kind of boring stuff. This is kind of the real nuts and bolts of the business. But I'm happy to see that we have a bunch of people here and a lot of smart folks here. And, and Audrey's doing a hell of a job. Get show Audrey there. Audrey's doing a hell of a job giving some counsel in, in that chat room right now. There she is, the lovely Audrey Ben Wally. An intern, she took her mom's and dad's advice, went to law school, and then she's going to get in the music business, folks. Can you believe it? Oh, God. Okay. Speaking of other great women in the music business, uh, and I expect that Audrey will be up there one day, too. On Friday, we're going to get a chance to talk to the number two number two woman in music, uh, according to Billboard magazine, a person I've known for years. Her name is Jody Gerson. She's been involved in the publishing business for years. She is the co-president of Sony ATV Music. She's going to be talking about her career a bit. But we're also going to be talking about what the role of a big-time music publisher is, and she has a lot of experience in that regard. So I hope you'll tune in on Friday. And there were some questions on the chat board that relate to publishers. We're going to make sure we ask them during the broadcast. But on that note of asking questions, go back one second there, Darren. <clears throat> if you go to the live stream event page, there's a place for you to post your questions right there. So if you can't be here for the show, we can get your questions uh, answered. Now, we're going to run a little bit late today, folks, because you guys have had a lot of great questions. Right now... I'm stoked to have with us a, a, a good friend of mine that I've known for years uh, by the name of Jake Versluce. I first met Jake way back, I guess, what, 15, 20 years ago when I was working at a, at a music startup called Artist Direct. Anyway, he worked here at Red Management for years, so he's a very uh, treasured alumni of the company here. But now he's obviously at doing much better. I saw the ride you pulled up on Jake. <laughs> Jake Versluce here from Position Music. Glad to have you back Thanks. in the office. How's it look, it's Jake? It's phenomenal. I, I was going to comment on uh, what you've done here. It's Remarkable. Looks yeah. great. Man, and I miss this couch. I spent a lot of quality days and months and years with the Duke, even. With the Duke. The Duke is, uh, is it went to college uh, this Good week. For him. With he my always son. was a smart dog. <laughs> he was always a very smart dog and, and an athlete, too, as you know. <laughs> okay, enough about Duke. Um, Jake, you are involved in the music licensing business now uh, at a company called Position Music. Give us a little idea of what it is you're doing over there, and then we'll talk about how you can, people like you can help folks. Uh, uh, like our Red Man Music and business members. Sure. So Position Music is a publishing company. Um, specifically, I do a and R there. Um, I also pitch a bit for video games, as we've got a pretty solid catalog of bands and composers. Um, so my job basically consists of scouting and looking for, you know, really high quality writers and bands, and then signing them to. To, to pub deals, and then we are, our core competence is really just getting that music placed into film and TV and video games and advertising. We don't worry about necessarily the mechanicals and all that stuff that the big publishers I think, and I think with. that's interesting because that's a that's a fundamental difference than what you know a big publisher would offer you a whole menu of services. You guys are either being more focused or more honest about it, perhaps by saying this is where we're going to yeah. focus our efforts and time and energy. Well, so, and you'll yeah. notice out of that whole kind of speech Mario gave, the thing that he said was the most lucrative part was was licensing. Yeah, and sinks, and that's what we do. Well, I think it's interesting. I, I think that didn't that wasn't always the case because back in the days yeah. when you sold lots of records, millions and millions and millions of copies, that mechanical, that extra buck a record that was unmortgaged, so to speak, right. was a huge number. I think as the record sales have created, particularly for rock bands, um, you know that number is smaller in the area that's growing is the license. Yeah, I mean it's not only that the record sales have gone down; it's that there's more and more spots in TV and movie. Compare a trailer now to the 1980s, mm -hmm. and there's substantially more music, so there's more opportunity within TV and film, then you add into that new revenue streams like YouTube and Spotify. So really, the key is the folks that, you know, own or co-own these copyrights. There's 
you know, Mark Geiger always said that there's more and more people listening to music now than ever before. So, you know, whittle that down to who's the, who owns the copyrights. That's where the money is. It's there's a reason I just drove in with a nicer car. Yeah, <laughs> you know what exactly, I mean? exactly, exactly. It wasn't because I was overpaying him, <laughs> oh, uh, but he got over that thankfully. Uh, okay, so tell us how you know, somebody signs to your company. Walk our, walk our viewers through what would happen if they were lucky enough to sign with a company like you guys with a focus. How do you go about getting their music in places that they hadn't imagined? Right. So this is a pretty, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of meat to this subject. I'm going to try to cover it briefly here. So on the chalkboard here, I've broken this down into the way that I approach it and, and which is also going to be from the artist's perspective, since I'm not guessing that's who most of our mm -hmm. viewers are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know. So walk us through it there. Jay. All right, so I've broken it down on basically the creative side of the songs as an A&R guy. Um, well, you know what, let me, let me back. I'll start with, there's actually two rights that are required when, when a song is licensed. There's, there's the master license and the sync license. And those you are, see that up there, folks? That's the, that's the top one okay. under, under the song itself. So if someone was to reach out to you and say, hey, like, I love your song, I want to use it in the new Dexter you know, mm -hmm. episode. There's actually, it's not one right, there's two rights. There's, there's the, syn the synchronization right, which again, Mario touched on, um, the synchronization license, and that's, that's who owns the music and the lyrics. Mm -hmm. That's one right and one that you pay for. And then there's the master license as well, which is the actual recording of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are two different payments, and um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how a song gets. Now, there's companies like ours that, that you know, we're a co-publisher and we also rep the master. So what we're, we're called uh, a one-stop, which is really useful for the music supervisors because, you know, with the Incubus guys, you've got uh, different writers involved on different songs, and, and that's, that's owned by, in some cases, a publisher or by the band. In other cases, the record label owns the master. So you're, as a music <laughs> yeah. supervisor, you're having to go clear it in all so these different places. So they have to both say yes, which complicates matters. And as matters. a one-stop, you literally come to a company like ours. We give you one signature, you're off and running. So that's, that's an important point to, to recognize is if you're going to approach this as a writer who knows what they're talking about to a music supervisor. Um, as an A&R guy, I don't go to a lot of shows necessarily anymore like I used to because I don't really care how they are live. I don't really care, you know, I don't need to get to hear if the, who the singer's dating and if the tire blew out, like I don't care. All I want to know is if the song's awesome and if it's produced well because that makes my job easy and I can pop it over to a friend or, you know, the music supervisor and they can slot it right into a show. So I can't stress enough, like, you know, do what it takes to learn how to write a song. If that's going to taxi conventions, if it's listening to Beatles songs a thousand times in a row, figure out how to write a well-written song. Um, and then don't be submitting demos to music. You know, get a, get a pretty well-produced song that I can makes my job easier, so I'm going to reach out to you and be like, hey, that's a great song, and I want to sign that, you know, to, to a publishing deal. <clears throat> that's the second point there. Um, Third one is, and jump in if you have any questions at any point, yeah, no, metadata, your, your music. If you're going to go through the work of writing and getting a song well produced and then submitting it to someone, um, make sure the information's on there, such as, I jotted some of this down here, band name, obviously, uh, the writers, and, and what the splits are of the writers, 25%, 25%, whatever it is, because that's important, who the publisher is and what their split is on it. Um, your contact info, so if I like it or the music supervisor likes it, obviously they can reach out to you. Um, and you might, might want to throw in the genre of music as well. Uh, I'll quickly move on to the fourth one. If you're going to go through, again, the, the, the trouble of producing a well-written song, make sure you're bouncing out the instrumental version as well. A lot of bands so still don't that. know that. So you, this is when it gets back to the, 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 what are the, the stems and all this stuff? Yeah, or, yeah. Know. And I know okay. I'm bouncing around a little bit here, but I'm trying to cover a lot of ground quickly. But basically, if you're, you know, as soon as you're done mixing and bouncing out the song, do a version that's just muting the vocals. We need to make my job easier and a music supervisor's job easier. A lot of times, and again, artists wouldn't know this, but when you're dropping that into a film or a video game or whatever, they need to sort of deftly be able to up different parts of the song over or under dialogue. And if they want to, s I have a number of artists that I've signed where the part that gets used more often is the instrumental version because it's underneath like a club scene or something. Mm -hmm. And they don't need some dude rocking out on his mic when they're trying mm -hmm. to have a conversation. It's, seriously, like if, if you submit without instrumentals, the possibility of licensing goes down substantially. I think what we're saying here, folks, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you're looking for a yes from somebody, yeah. use my song, 
make it as easy as possible yeah. to get a yes, right? Don't yeah. make people call you back because they probably won't. Because the thing is, it's a supply and demand thing, right? There's so much supply. If you have a great song and you're going to put make me go through an extra 30 minutes, of di- I'm on to the next song. I yeah, don't folks, have time yeah, for it. Yeah, folks got to get rid of this romantic notion that somehow the song is just going to spin somebody's head. Yeah. Maybe it does, but you got to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, no, totally. And there's a ton more things you can do, and I'm just trying to touch on the Keep top Keep going. Ones. I'll get out of the way. All right, <laughs> so the fifth one, just as an A&R guy, nothing's more frustrating than you as the artist going through all these first four things, and then I hear your music somewhere, or I hear it on Facebook, and... Actually, I don't hear it on Facebook. That's the problem because as an A&R guy, I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook and I'm clicking through friends of friends and, and to go to a Facebook page and you know click on a song or try to click on a song that's like locked. And mm-hmm. if, if your viewers don't know what that means, mm-hmm. that means you can't play the song unless you like it as a friend. I don't have time for that. Like I want to click on the song and contact you. So I would say use the uh, application band page, which I think you've touched on before you, yep. you, you talked to Jay. You spoke to Jay. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great software or something similar, but I'd recommend band page is free. So it makes folks who, it makes it easier for folks to find you and listen to your music and reach out. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stupid mistake to go through all that, all that work and then not have your music accessible and, re- and easy to reach out and, and listen to. So those, that's the song portion. Um, if, but any of, if anyone has any questions on the Jay, creative, Andrew, we do we have any that. questions for Jake? We'll take a question or two right here. Uh, I have one right now. Okay, Audrey, um, take it away, Miss Ben Waleed. Okay, so Brian Parnell has a TV, film, and video game licensing question. Mm-hmm. He wants to know how best an independent band should seek out licensing. Is it best to go through someone like Taxi, Music, X-Ray, Music Libraries? or to try and find someone who works for a network or a studio? So good question, and that's actually something I'm going to cover in the next portion of your under business. Perfect segue. Yeah, yeah. so that actually <laughs> is a perfect segue. So now I'm going to move in more into the business side. Um, so you've got the great song, you've got, your, you've got your band page up, you've got the music accessible and ready to rock. Okay, so on the business side, your key person you're going after is a music supervisor. Seems pretty obvious. Some viewers may or may not know that. But the, the gatekeeper to all of these different areas, uh, TV, film, whatever, is a music supervisor that's been hired by the company to be the person who chooses the music that goes into whatever that is, a movie. Uh, some advertising agencies don't have music soups yet, but let's skip that one for now. Let's, let's, let's concentrate on the ones that are TV and film and so your options are, to answer uh, our question Brian. right here, are you can get to know the music supervisors. You know, that's, I'm in L.A. These are now a lot of my these friends. These are people you're spending time yeah. with now. Or you can live in L.A., New York, and those are just about your only two options. So if you're not already doing that, you need to basically hire someone. Um, and to get back to what he was saying, when I say hire someone, that could be, you know, yes, using websites like Taxi um, or... Uh, I think there's one called Music X-Ray, whose job basically have made themselves themselves available to artists to submit their music, and then they, for a fee, you know, they'll promise to submit it to all these different places. And that's kind of like a. That's certainly a way to go. It's a pretty removed way to it, go. It doesn't have the personal connection side that and you and I both know right, is, is key a, to the like, whole process. And so, I don't, again, I, I want to bust everybody's romantic notion <laughs> that the song is just going to fly away like a freaking bird. It doesn't yeah. happen that way. It's about who you know. Uh, so those places are better than nothing, I exactly. suspect. It's better than nothing and uh, a place to start. And, you know, I was just spoke at the taxi convention two months ago, and then that's a website that does X number of conventions. One, that's where you can meet people, you can learn more, you can learn some songwriting. And so those are, those are good options. It's a place to start. But yeah, at the end of the day, like myself and other folks at a place like Position Music, these are our friends. We're going to their birthday parties. We're going to mixers with them. We're going to Kings games with them. Like that's the lifestyle we live. And so, you know, the next step is then, well, okay, if you're able to get, you know, in touch with or someone like myself reaches out to bands, which I've done that I don't even know, um, to, to sign them to a co-pub deal where, like, our company is based on finding quality bands and composers that generate a lot of revenue for our company and the writers. And so, you know, one step higher than, I guess, a taxi would be to, you know, hire a company that could rep. There's basically two different ways. They, they, they can rep your uh, music for a fee, whatever it is, 15, 20, 50 percent in some cases. And um, there's... A few companies that do that, I think, you know, like a Secret Road and Zinc and stuff like that, um, will rep music. And then, and then another option is actually sign a co-pop deal, which is what we do. And, you know, I, I like to think that the companies are even more incentivized when they're sharing in it 
to make sure that they're really having a high success rate. Not for, always for the case, say. but you know, when people do have an incentive and they are motivated, you're going to get a you're going to get a better look, I suppose. Let me yeah, ask I you. mean, not only that, but as a co publisher, we also give advances. You know, I can't guarantee that's the case there for. You go. That's for a good reason. I put my manager hat on. <laughs> Advance is good. <laughs> And look, I, I've been a manager too. Yeah, I learned yeah. under the best, so I know how this goes. I'm, you know. Yeah, get the money. That's what Jake. You ever hear that around the office here? Oh, get the money. Every every. Did we have a dollar bill that was we still, stuck to still, the desk? It's behind says, the red the curtain money. here, folks. Yeah. I showed it to Joe when he got here. I said, "That's your mantra. Get every day the freaking money, folks. It's not just me having a bad day. Carry yeah. on." But, but, but actually, let me interrupt okay. you for just a second. You mentioned the music supervisor. I know lots of folks out there are going to have to do this themselves. Is yeah. there some kind of listing service? Is there a resource that you could recommend that at least nominally lists right. the names and in email address, perhaps a music supervisor? It's a really good question. There's not a lot of options. There's one that I've found. Um, I, I want to call it the sort of like the, the music business registry. I think oh, that's okay. Right. We talked to Except, Rich Ezra, and we, we got to go back to Rich because somehow we garbled the audio on They have that one that's specifically called TV and film. They, okay. they do a good job. I mean, they, I've looked through it. They, there's maybe, you know, 20% of all the ones that are available, but it's better than nothing because okay. to answer your question, there really isn't. A great resource. You can go to a place again like Taxi. They'll help you out. I know a lot of these places because I'm in the business, but I don't just go tell everyone necessarily. Like you have to kind of know me. Mm. But um, yeah, so that would get be... to that part here. <laughs> okay, carry on. Yeah. Sorry, Jake. Okay. So let's assume you know you've got all the song part knocked out. You've got a great song. A music supervisor decides they want to use your music, which is great. Um, the next part is the, the business of allowing them to use your music. So we talked about the master license and the sync license. So let's assume you've got that all cleaned up. Let's even assume a best case scenario where the writer who's written an incredibly good song, you know, uh, they, own, they own their own writing, obviously, and, and publishing, or they're with a company like Position. But let's just say that they're, that they're on their own. The music supervisor has one person to deal with, and it's the writer, because they represent both sides. So then the music supervisor, or the clearance person who works with the music supervisor, is going to be in touch with the writer and the band and clear those licenses with them and kind of negotiate what the, what the amount of money is going to be paid from, which is why I have up there zero dollars, which happens in some cases, independent films, whatnot, all the way up to, as Mario mentioned, Three hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars, five hundred million. Like this million happens. Million. Yeah. Now we're talking about you know your viewers probably bands trying to break in. Mm -hmm. So you might get a thousand dollars all in. And by the way, if you hear the term all in, that means they're covering both sides. Five hundred for the master, five hundred for the sync. So you you know you'd sign off on paperwork, you'd send that back to the music soup, and then you've got the paperwork portion knocked out. You've got either the upfront payment of zero dollars to, to whatever plus. Now this is the key, and this goes back to your ASCAP guest. Um, you start, you know, you start getting some PRO royalties through ASCAP and BMI once that, once that TV show starts airing. You know, and that's that's where a lot of this money can start kicking in, especially if you get multiple uses over the course of weeks. Let me ask you this: in your experience, and I've watched it, you know, anecdotally, you know, watching TV night. It, in the days in the past, they would. Music apps or, or people that wanted music wanted big songs from big artists, right? And yeah. those artists wanted big paydays. Guys like me yeah. wanted to get paid, you know, so the band got paid. I see more and more new artists, not exploding artists, you know, yeah. artists that don't have a big hit yet, getting placements in, in, in TV shows and, in, and so forth. Um, speak to that, if you would, well, because part I of think it, that's who we're talking to here. Yeah, today. well, for sure we are. I mean, part of that goes back to my original point that there's more room now for music than there ever has been before in TV shows. Like there's more channels on TV than there ever were before. There's just more of everything. So there's more opportunity, which is great because it creates jobs for people like me and it creates the ability to get more music in these than there ever were before. So you've still got the big ones out there that the drop in, you know, 300, 500, you know, Led Zeppelin's up in the game now. You've got, you know, you've got all these big bands that, where they're dropping major cash for these. That's still out there, but it, the budgets have shrunk. And so you've, you've got now also high quality bands that um, that may not be known that have the ability to sort of wiggle their way in and the music supervisors as you guys have probably heard before your viewers are new are the new A&R guys you know what used to be at labels so yeah. they want to be in touch and online and figuring out who the new breaking buzzing bands are um, they'll grab them for lower you know less money because they're not big yet and then boom six month lumineers you know if you pull open Billboard yeah. from last couple of weeks ago, there's a huge, great article on how that band blew up in a year. Yeah. 
You know, we're going to be talking with the, uh, the gentleman that runs their label here soon, and we'll no, talk perfect. some more about it. I think of the song from the band in France, uh, what was it, Phoenix, that Phoenix. had the song yeah. in the TV commercial. Never heard of the band before they yeah. actually broke through a TV commercial. We're going to be speaking to the manager of Young the Giant on Friday, and uh, awesome. they're, they're, they had a song in the Budweiser commercials that have been running. So it's so great from a manager's point of view, I'll tell you, that for folks out there that are just starting out and you're trying to get a notice, it's so important to find... A vehicle to do that. And as we talked about one day, we had a whole lesson on that Jake's heard before about yeses and nos. Earlier in your career, you got to be a little more yes oriented. And yeah. sometimes that means taking a little bit less dose so that you can build something. Well, and you remember, yeah. I was managing bands too. And the, my first stop would always be going into the licensing world for two reasons. One, for exposure, because you're helping to build the resume so you can start knocking out all these bullet points on your website about all these different shows you've been on. And two, it's a direct source of income, which then starts funding other things, like touring, like recording, whatever. So it's always my first stop. That's why I got to know these music, music soups pretty early on. Well, I just want to say this, Jake. You know, I, I've watched uh, Jake here grow up in the business, and I just want to say I, I love it when... Uh, one of my former guys can sit there and give me some <laughs> lessons here. And I've been taking notes. And I want to I appreciate you coming in. Do we have any more questions for Jake before he goes? We're running, running way over time here today, but I want yeah. to make sure. And by the way, I want to thank all you folks for sticking around. You're a loyal bunch here. Yeah. The last thing I was going to say, actually, before, before we take questions, is normally I have people submit through the submissions at positionmusic.com. Mm -hmm. But for your viewers that have taken the time to pop on here, my email address is up there. If they feel like they've got what it takes and want to submit some music directly to me, my email address is jakev at positionmusic.com. Don't abuse it, folks, but it's there exactly. if you have something Don't abuse. Do we, Have we had that scroll in there, Joe, too? Uh, not the email. Not that. We're going to put that up. That's jakev at positionmusic.com. Dot com, not Jake at Ren Management. Right. Dot com. Surprising. <laughs> it took me a while to even We not probably be still typing. have that. Are we still paying for Jake's email there, Joe? I hope not. <laughs> no, nothing personal. Um, all right. Any more questions for Audrey's got another question for you, and then we're going to let you get back to work, make some real money here. Appreciate that. Audrey, you're um, on. Yeah. So Craig Meyer has a question. It's pretty general, but maybe you could give a scope. He just wants to know what a deal would typically look like for a sync in TV or movie from a dollars and cents standpoint. Okay, all right. So let's take a you know a basic band that you know is just starting out but has good good music. It's similar to what I said before. It's probably going to be a thousand dollars all in. So you know you'll get you'll get two pieces of paper. Yeah, you, you have one or maybe it'll be one piece of paper depending on who the company is. But it'll say five hundred dollars sync fee, five hundred dollar uh, or master license. And maybe it's two thousand dollars. You know, I, it, it it really it'll really range. But let's let's put it in the one to two thousand dollar range for for baby bands that no one's heard of but have good music. And now obviously that number goes up. I've seen it ha myself as the band starts getting more buzz. But you know, then maybe you're looking in the five to ten thousand dollar range. But it's you know, it's a, it's a lucrative. And, then, and just to be clear, folks, you still own your song. You're Correct. licensing and not giving it away. It's not like a publishing deal where now somebody, the, the guy who's licensing it owns that song. They own the use in that film or that right. thing forever, but you, you own your song. So uh, any, any other questions? And then we're going to get on out of here today because we are going way over time. Um, well, Jason just had one other question um, based on location, and he just wondered if it's essential that your licensing person should be located in L.A., or can they kind of do it remotely? I suggested probably L.A. But yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. I've been on both sides as a manager. I've had artists that have been represented by companies, good companies in, in other states, and they do their best to kind of, like, have people from their company pop out to L.A. And, look, my answer is going to be... From the artist's point of view, it's best to have someone who lives and breathes in L.A. and like grows up with these people. But that's not to take away from companies who are based other places that can do a really good job. Let me ask you one question. Jake, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Connecticut. Okay, where'd you go to college? University of Florida. And where do you work in the business? Los Angeles. There's your answer, folks. <laughs> uh, you know, Sam Kinison said it best, go where the food is. Yeah. All right, so that's all right. All right, that is our show for today. Joe, Jake, thanks. Joe, I've been going through this for forever. Years. And Joe's and Jake's, he's used to it. At least Seth, I didn't call you Duke, Duke right? Duke, got that. Uh, Duke, he's, we, 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 we yeah. respond to just about anything here. Yeah. It's been great having all you folks on with us today. I hope you learned something. This is... 
you know, it's important stuff. It's much sexier writing a song. It's much sexier um, playing a show or doing a press, you know, interview or playing on a TV show. But getting the business part uh, of your career right, getting the money, folks, all kidding aside, is one of the most important things you can do. In learning about publishing, learning where to, what value your songs have and how to get that value out is one of the most crucial things you will do after you write that song. So thanks for joining us today. I hope you'll come back on Friday. We got Jody. Gerson from uh, Sony ATV Music. She's going to talk about her career in the music biz, how she has managed to ascend to the highest levels of the business. And she's also going to tell us about what goes on in a big music publishing company. So my name is Steve Rennie. This is uh, the Ren Man Music and Business.com. I am the Ren Man and I am out of here. Thanks for joining us.